Hello and thank you for coming on to this session. Um, I'm going to tell you about my master's research project and by the end you will be relative experts on why bacteria have defence systems, what they're defending against and how they do that. So, we all know what a bacteria is, right? They are tiny microorganisms, they exist in every niche in the world. In fact, in your body right now, you have more bacterial cells than you do human cells. So we have good bacteria, like those that exist in your gut and keep your digestive health, and those that exist in the oceans and produce oxygen and fixed carbon for us. And we also have bad bacteria, so these are also called pathogenic bacteria. Um, and these are responsible for 7.7 .7 million deaths, which is about 14% of global deaths every single year. So we also all know what a virus is, right? COVID-19, HIV, the flu. But what you might not know is that in the same way that we can be infected by viruses, become sick and even die, bacteria also have viruses. So these are called bacteriophage. Um, and these are obviously not the same as human viruses. So the word bacteriophage comes from the bacteria and phagin, which is Greek and it means to eat. So these are literally bacteria eaters. Now this is slightly misleading name because they are much, much smaller than bacteria, so they don't actually engulf or eat them, but they are bacteria killers. And I'm interested in what the relationship between these two organisms actually looks like. So since the beginning of time, since about three billion years ago, bacteria and phage have been in a constant co-evolutionary battle, which is also called an arms race. Um, so they're basically evolving these arsenals against each other. So I've made a little illustration for this. So this is your bacteria, and it will be infected by your phage. Now your bacteria will evolve resistance to your phage, and the phage can't infect. But then the phage will evolve to subvert these resistance mechanisms, and now your phage can infect. And then your bacteria will evolve, and so on and so forth. You get the picture. So my research essentially is to understand um, and find novel ways that bacteria protect themselves against phage infection. So why should you care about this? Well that's a great question and it is the most important question when you're doing any sort of research is that so what? So luckily for you I have three main answers to this and I'll just take you through them now. So phage are currently one of the most promising answers we have to the problem of antibiotic resistance. Now, if you don't know what antibiotic resistance is, haven't heard of it, we're currently facing a world health crisis that the antibiotics that we've relied on for so long are basically no longer um, sufficient to deal with the bacterial infections that we have. And it's thought that antibiotic resistance kills about three and a half thousand people a day. So it's not just bacteria, but that's actually antibiotic resistant bacteria kill that many people a day. And as I've mentioned, phage have been training since the beginning of time to become the most dangerous natural predators of bacteria. So we can actually use phage um, as a resource to fight against these bacterial infections. So the way that phage therapy works briefly is that you administer these cocktails, which is probably not as fun as it sounds, of phage to um, of the patient with a bacterial infection. And the phage will essentially kill the bacteria that are causing their illness but not affect their human cells or their other health in any other way. But in order to do this, we need to understand which phage infect which bacteria, and then most importantly, since the problem that we have with antibiotics is the ability of bacteria to develop resistance, we need to understand how um, bacteria develop resistance to phage and, and which bacteria might develop resistance to which phage. Second reason we are interested in um, antiphage defense systems is biotechnology. So historically, antiphage defense systems have given us a wealth of biotechnological resources that the world today just wouldn't be the same without. So the best example I can give of this is CRISPR. So just by a show of hands, who's heard of CRISPR? Yeah, okay. If you haven't, then CRISPR is a gene editing technology, essentially. It took the world by the storm in about 2011, and it has applications across um, curious genetic disease treating cancer, diagnostics, um, in modifying crops for food security or biofuels for sustainable energy. It's an absolutely amazing resource. But did we invent CRISPR? Absolutely not. CRISPR is an antiphage defense system. So it's one of these systems that bacteria have been evolving against phage. And the sort of 
logic behind this is if we look into these bacterial genomes, there's a good chance we might find more of these systems that can help society. And then my third reason is environmental. Everybody loves the environment. Um, and let's take, for example, the marine environment. So there are these bacteria in the marine environment called cyanobacteria. Um, and these are a little bit different from normal bacteria because they're photosynthetic organisms, so they fix carbon and they produce um, oxygen. And they're actually responsible for fixing a quarter of the carbon on the planet. So when you're thinking about global warming, climate change, and our urgent need to remove carbon dioxide from the air, then these guys are going to be really important for that. And like all bacteria, cyanobacteria have phage. They are called cyanophage. So every single day, cyanophage kill up to 40% of marine cyanobacteria. Now that number probably doesn't really mean anything, but to put that into context, that number is equivalent to the number of animals that have ever existed. So that's not just the number of species that have ever existed or the number of animals alive today, the number of individual animals that have ever existed in the history of the world. So that is just a massive number. Um, and because of that reason, then the relationship between cyanobacteria and their cyanophage is going to be really important for tackling the problems that we're having today. So hopefully I've convinced you all of the importance of phage and the importance of understanding bacteria phage relationships. Now let's get into the nitty gritty of how do you find a bacterial immune system. Luckily I've broken this down into a neat five step plan for you all. Okay, so the first step is to identify systems and you do this by making resistant mutants, which is much easier than it sounds. You just put bacteria and phage together and you see which bacteria become resistant. Like I've explained, bacteria have been training for them since the beginning of time. So they become resistant naturally. And it's really easy to see which ones are resistant because they're the only ones that are alive. So once you have these resistant mutants, then you can identify potential defense systems within their genomes by sequencing. So you can read the string of A's, T's, C's, and G's that make up their genome, that make up the genetic material. And then once you have this, you can identify mutations that are conserved across resistant mutants. And the logic is, if there are the same mutations in lots and lots of resistant strains of bacteria, but it's not present in susceptible strains, there's a good chance that that gene, that resistance, is going to play a role in resistance. So, right, now you have the system identified right down to the gene. The way that you can sort of validate or look further into the functions of these genes is again really simple. You just put it into a place it wasn't and take it out of a place it was. So you can do um, a knockout. So this is where you have your gene of interest, you have your gene that's mutated in the resistant bacteria, you knock it out and you see what happens to that bacteria. So if it becomes susceptible to phage infection, then there's a good chance that it was involved in resistance. And then with that very same gene, you can take it from the resistant strain and you can pop it into a strain that doesn't naturally contain that gene. And then again, if you infect that bacteria with phage and it's resistant, then you have pretty much like validated that gene that you think is responsible. So the last thing you can do, um, which I'll just touch on briefly, is you can do RNA sequencing. So I haven't mentioned RNA thus far, um, but RNA is just the intermediate molecule that basically converts the information that's stored in your genes and your DNA um, into functional proteins. So if you look at essentially what's going on in your RNA, what proteins are being produced before and then during the different stages of infection of the bacteria with a phage, then that will give you an indication as to which genes are switched on, which genes are involved in the bacterial immune response. So I'm about two weeks off uh, lab finishing lab work and about five weeks off submitting, so I won't spoil the, uh, the answer for you. But I think all that's left for me to say is thank you to listening, thank you to my amazing supervisor and the rest of the faculty lab. And if you're interested in hearing more, then I actually talk about my work on the internet because who doesn't nowadays? Um, so I have an Instagram account, it's called Science My Mum. Hopefully the it's not just a phage mum is sort of circling back around now to make a bit more sense. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening and if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer.